Good evening, everyone. We continue our study in the book of Isaiah, and we are now in chapter 34. It begins this way. Each time we look at a chapter in Isaiah, each chapter is standalone. It is not in a chronological order, and much of the poetic language that is being used uh, as God speaks of a future situation or event or the state of things uh, are oftentimes using poetic language, which means that when we read the text itself, understanding the Hebrew, we really need to take one step back and look at the imagery that it's trying to convey. Now, Oriental languages, like how we speak in our own daily lives, will also often be using literal words, but trying to paint the image of the picture, which would be the message, rather than the literalness of the language. And so the poetic language is important for us to understand. The fact that each chapter is not in a chronological order is also important for us to realize. Now, today the chapter is rather short. And so we would spend a little bit of time to look at some of the Hebrew words so that we can also learn a little bit more Hebrew. It begins this way, come near you nations to hear. And heed, you people, let the earth hear and all that is in it, the world and all things that come forth from it. Now, as it begins, it is also trying to paint us the theme of the entire chapter. So it begins to be important for us to understand who is the prophecy addressed to. So Isaiah is now speaking. And is speaking that God is going to do something to them. So the first phrase that we have here is that we need to identify the audience. The audience is this, you nations. And the word nations is goyim. Now this word goyim refers to nations as all nations, right? Uh, where there are people groups. It is generally referred to as a non-Hebrew people or nations. And so in this particular case, goyim actually refers to non-Israel. So all the non-Israel nations are invoked to first come near. The idea of coming near is to draw near, to approach. These are the same words when, when the Israelites come near to the temple or uh, draw near to God, uh, come to the tabernacle. That is the understanding. The, the, the action is to come near to the person who is speaking. And so Isaiah is saying, come, come, near, come nearer so that you can hear. Now, that word is Shema. Now, the word hear, as I have often said, it is literally to hear the sound, hear the speech, hear what Isaiah is saying, and in much of the case, it needs to require some form of an understanding uh, to perceive what is being said. And oftentimes, it will require the person to act on it, which means that this word here uh, oftentimes is translated as obey. But within this context of what we're talking about, it's really uh, a, 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 a declaration to call the goyim, the, the non-Hebrew people, to come nearer to Isaiah and heed, pay attention to what he has to say. And in this case, these are people, and with this people, 
we are still talking about the non-Israel nations in this context, right? In this context. And so we have in our midst, in verse 1, an A and a B. Basically, to instruct the non-Israel nations to hear the sound, hear what Isaiah is saying, and pay attention. So the idea of hear is the same as heed, to pay attention. Synonyms, literally. Now, the next phrase here is, let the earth or the land, right, the land here. And it also says all that is in the land. Then the world and all things that comes forth from it. Again, this would be an A and a B. It is to call them to also hear. So understand that verse 1 is really to call the nations and the land that they occupy, right? The land that they occupy to listen to what Isaiah have to say about what God is speaking. That is the theme of chapter 34. And so by a using uh, the poetic language by referring to them as goyim and referring to the land which they occupy, they are to then understand what God is going to do to them. So this is a prophecy. But when we get to verse 2, you would find that the language that is being spoken is, is spoken as if it has completed itself. Now, let me demonstrate to you what I mean. It says here, the indignation of the Lord is against all nations. Again, this word nation is goyim. Remember, this chapter is about the goyim, right? Now, indignation would be fury. It is similar to the idea of anger, but this one, I think you could give, give a, an idea that the, the anger is really uh, very hot. And this word fury in the second case means the, the heat, which tells us that you need to understand uh, anger, wrath, heat, all of this is depicting how angry God is. That's the whole picture. And it's against the nations. His fury is against all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them. He has given them over to the slaughter. Now we will come back to these words. It's important for us to realize all this is spoken as if completed. Now, prophecies of God sometimes are often expressed in that way. But more importantly, in this particular instance, it is as if it is done. That this is destroyed, it, they are slaughtered. And so, the verse 2 now documents what God is going to do so that they are to hear and when God speaks of this prophecy, it is considered a done deal. It is going to happen as good as it has happened. That is the understanding in the Hebrew. It goes on and says, Also their slain shall be thrown out, their stench shall rise from their corpses. So slain and corpses goes hand in hand. And a mountain shall be melted with their blood. This would be an A, a B, and a C. So all of this will talk about the destruction. But it's a destruction of the people. So understand that here we are speaking as if it has been done. And here it is a description of what? will appear as a result of God destroying them. So people will die. So the picture that we're given here is the people who fought in the war, 
they are slain, and so they will co be called corpses. As they are thrown out, they will have stench as they start to decay. And the mountains shall be melted with their blood, which the emphasis is not the mountain. The emphasis is about their blood and about the volume, right? The volume of their blood covered on their mountain. So we're talking about the, their earth and their world, their mountains, which is there. And this imagery continues to be very graphic. It says, all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved. The heavens shall be rolled up like a scroll. Their hosts shall fall down like the leaf falls from the vine, like the fruit falling from a fig tree. Now, here is a description of the state. It is a terrifying view. The terrifying view is that the, the stars of the heavens will melt away. The heavens will roll up like a scroll. Now, as you know, if you talk about a scroll, it looks something like this. And then as it rolls itself up, there will be no more sky. There will be no more sun, moon, and stars. So it talks about the dissolving of it, putrefying, meaning no more stars. The host shall fall down. Now, the idea, idea here of falling down is like uh, falling stars. So we have pictures of meteor and asteroids falling down, catching fire as it comes into the contact with the Earth's atmosphere. Now, that's, that's the picture that we're given. So there is cosmic turbulence as a picture. It is so terrifying that that destruction that God is putting in place is equivalent to the utter destruction of the heavens. Now, that is the picture that we are painting. And it is a complete complete destruction because God says he utterly destroyed them. Or we could say that um, God has destroyed them in a complete way, right? In a complete way. So this is a picture that the people die. The events is terrifying. The destruction is terrifying. And the meteors or the, the stars that's falling down from the sky falls like a leaf from the vine, meaning it is definite. It can be seen. And it is, it is experienced. So this is not talking about anything spiritual. This is literally saying that these things are going to happen. So when you go back and read Ezekiel 38 and 39 about the war of Gog and Magog coming to Israel, then you'll find that there will be some, ex uh, some interesting uh, description of the then war. It's, it's an incredible war. And this passage that we're reading right now in Isaiah chapter 34 describes a certainty that God will do to the Goyim. And this is actually uh, an expression of a judgment. In verse 5, again, very graphic in its description, it says here, my, that is God's sword. Not that God is wielding a sword, but it is literally showing us in a graphic manner that God is actually executing judgment. So my sword shall be bathed in the skies. Indeed, it shall come down on a dome, on the people of my curse for judgment. So this is a graphic picture and it's speaking about a dome. Now, this is something which I guess we need to actually understand. Uh, God is describing as he is, he is wielding a knife. 
a sword and is attacking, killing along the way. Remember, this is a picture. And this is God's judgment upon a particular group of people called Adam. Now, this requires us to understand a little bit because Adam, as we can see from the scripture, has not done anything so terrible to, uh, to be worthy of such grave judgment. And it has led many people to equate this to Rome. So I'm just telling you that there is an equation that whenever you see the intent of God to destroy a dome, uh, the, the, the old commentators believe that it is not speaking about the literal Adam, which is over, but the Adam, which symbolically is represented by Rome. And this comes from the Nebuchadnezzar's metallic image dream in Daniel chapter 2. Because after Rome, there will be a revival of Rome. And it is important for us to note that it is entering into that state of the future time. Continuing on with the sword, it says the sword of the Lord is filled with blood. So it is bathed in heaven with blood. It's all red. So the sky is red. It is made overflowing with fatness, with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra and a great slaughter in the land of Edom. So let's break this down a little bit. Understand that all of this is about a slaughter. A slaughter means a great killing. A great killing means lots of animals in, in a metaphor right, of animals and uh, a lot of blood, right? A lot of blood as well. So think of it this way. The word play here is between sacrifice and slaughter. But let's look at the first part first. It's overflowing with fatness, lambs, goats, rams. All of these are symbolic language of kings, leaders, and commanders. So it is the picture that God is going after the goyim, their enemy, and each particular category of the army is represented by a particular animal. But when it talks about the idea of fatness, the fat of kidneys, it gives you now a picture of Leviticus, how the animals that's been killed for an offering to God called a sacrifice is actually to remove the fat and burn it specifically for God. And the book of Leviticus tells us this, that all the fat belongs to God. And so this particular verse 6, the last part talking about a sacrifice and a slaughter, speaks about the same thing. It is an A and a B. It is a killing. It is a slaughter. So let me explain this to you sacrifice, which we always use this word. Sacrifice comes from the word uh, zevak. Right? Zevak. Now, zevak uh, is written this way. This is the time to learn a little Hebrew. And then we have the word slaughter. And slaughter comes from a similar sounding word. And this is tevak. And it, it's written this way.
Now, I just want you to just look at these words so that you understand. Sevak, Tevak. The last two letters are the same with the same sound. The first letter is the only one that is a variable sound. One is pronounced as Zevak, which is sacrifice. The second is pronounced as Tevak, which is slaughter. As you know, Hebrew words are often related by their root. And so the idea of Zevak and Tevak gives you a picture of killing. So the idea of sacrifice is often imagined as an offering. But this is wrong. A sacrifice should always be understood as a killing. And in this case, of animals. To be used in an offering. So the key to zevak, which is translated as sacrifice, is about killing. And then we have the second word, tevak. And tevak is clearly a slaughtering or butchering of animals. So in both cases, they sound the same and they are both related to the killing of Things. And hence, in this verse here, for the Lord has a sacrifice in Bosra and a great slaughter in the land of Edom, is actually an A and a B because they both refer to the same idea as an emphasis a killing. A killing for God Himself because it talks about the fatness and it depicts a form of a sacrifice. Uh, using the language of animals, but God is actually talking about killing the goyim in a form of a sacrifice to himself. And so verse 6 is a very peculiar expression using animals as if a, a sacrifice, a sevak, but it is essentially a tevak, which is to kill all of them in the land of Bosra and Adom, which is both in the same uh, area, right? Both in the same area. There is another Bosra in Moab, but in this case, we see it as an A and a B. The emphasis is the killing. It is very important for us to understand this. So learning a little bit of Hebrew helps us because the word sacrifice and the word slaughter generally doesn't go hand in hand in our minds, in the English, but in the Hebrew, they go hand in hand all the time. We look at verse 7. Again, the idea of animals representing, so symbolic of king leaders and commanders. The wild oxen shall come down with them. The young bulls with the mighty bulls, their land will be soaked with blood and their dust will be saturated with fatness. Now again, seven and six are talking about the same thing. God is going to create a great slaughter sounding in the words that has been used like a sacrifice, but actually it is a slaughter. Verse eight, it says, For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance. Now verse eight, is about vengeance. Uh, I think we need to understand the word vengeance here uh, is to revenge. Right? The word here is to revenge. Now, in the old days, vengeance is when someone kills another and then the victim's family will then go after the perpetrator and to kill them, and, and then the, the, the family of the one that is being killed will always try to kill the other. So vengeance is, is really a bloody thing in past history. And because of that, 
Uh, we need to understand that the day of the Lord's vengeance is when God was patient and it comes upon in time when God will, will, will pay retribution on the Goyim upon the works that they have done against Israel. And so it says here, the year of recompense for the cause of Zion. So recompense, vengeance, basically we're talking about payback. Right, payback. And God will give the due payback because of Zion. Its streams shall be turned into pitch like tar, its dust into brimstone, which is sulfur, its land shall become burning pitch. So you find that all these three is an A, B, and C. It is burning. That's the emphasis, it's about burning. And this burning shall not be quenched night or day. Its smoke shall ascend forever. Now this word forever is to a long time. How long? We don't know. We're not told. So whenever the Bible talks about a long time, this word olam is used. And it says, how long? From generation to generation it shall lie waste. And no one shall pass through it forever and ever. Now, this word forever and ever is another expression. Uh, the idea of forever and ever is not olam. This word here should be read as uh, to, I guess you can say, um, from glory to glory, it says here, from glory, from perpetuity to perpetuity. I guess that would be a word to use. Um, from time to time. Which is another way of saying olam, which is another way of saying to for a long time. So what you see here is, the emphasis of the result of God's vengeance. Now, in 11 and 12, it talks about the state of this place. 11 and 12 now describes the animals. Now, we have a series of animals which we don't really know exactly what animals they are. But let me give you the... The, the some of the thinking. Now, the thinking is these are animals which we are using modern English word to represent, but we don't know exactly what species they are. But it is said that these are animals that will occupy the place that God has turned into destruction. So it says here, pelican and owl. Now, this word, Porcupine. Um, we don't really know the word. We think it is porcupine, hedgehog, uh, owl. These these are just suggested words, right? It says owls or pelicans, uh, and the idea of porcupine. Don't know what exactly they are, hedgehog. And then the owl and the raven. And this one, we know that these are modern words. And raven uh, shall dwell in it. And he shall stretch out over it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. Now, this one needs a bit of retranslation. It says here, the line of waste and it says here the plumb bobs or the 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 weights or plumbing line plumbing line of emptiness now what is trying to say here is this the idea here is not just mere stones of emptiness. The, the picture here is, is we're given some, 
some um, masonry terms. The masonry terms is to describe how extensive it is done. And in this case, the extensiveness of destruction and allocation to the animals are using masonry uh, terminology so that it gives us an impression that all of these are specially designed and specially planned by God. It is not just a random allocation. It is something that God has devised. It is something that God has uh, specifically and impeccably uh, set apart for this kind of a destruction. So the idea here is to make sure that we understand that this destruction is thorough, it is planned, and it is executed with precision. That's the imagery language that we're reading here. And then we see in verse 12, they shall call its nobles to the kingdom, but none shall be there and all its princes shall be nothing. Again, a very imagery language. The imagery language means that all of this will be gone. It is a thorough, destruction, right? a thorough destruction. In verse 13, it talks about thorns, nettles, brambles, and this literally means that these are plants that humans don't like, but they are definitely very special plants that will defend whatever it crawls over. So in Genesis chapter 3, we are given the understanding uh, of, of uh, thorns and thistles. I'm not sure whether you remember that. Thorns and thistles as a picture of the protection of the land. So thorns and thistles in that idea is protecting the land. Thorns, nettles, and brambles, and these are different words. They are also waste plants. They are not your useful plants for food, but it is there all over the palaces and the fortresses, which means that if you, if you just imagine the palaces are destroyed, the fortresses are destroyed, the people are destroyed, and all these thorns, nettles, and brambles grow all over it to a point where humans cannot inhabit. And so the animals will inhabit it. A habitation of jackals, a courtyard for ostriches. The wild bees of the desert shall also meet with the jackals and the wild goat shall bleed to its companion. The night creature shall rest there and find herself a place of rest. And this idea, the night creature, the lilith, uh, could be seen as a form of an owl or uh, some kind of a a nocturnal creature. And basically, it's telling us that all the palaces, all the fortresses will no longer be occupied. The arrow snake shall make her nest and lay eggs, hatch, gather them under her shadow. There shall also be hawks gathered, everyone with her mate. What we are told here is that instead of people, God has assigned them to animals, which also listen to God. So that is the extent of judgment upon the Goyim. Now that's the picture that we're given all the way up to verse 15. Now, we have two more verses that ends our chapter today. So it says here, search from the book of the Lord and read. 
The first word here, search, literally talks about an instruction and is in the imperative. It is to inquire, ask, to seek, answer. And the answer is not coming from God himself. This is now, this is now instructions to Israel to tell them, look, go and check what God has written. Now, this one book is something that is written. And then read. This word read is important because in the old days, people don't actually go to a book to read. And so it has to be read by someone, right? It has to be read by someone. And so this word read is read out loud for the people to hear. And so usually you find the Levites that will be reading this. It says, none of these shall fail. None of the things that God has said will fail because it has been thoroughly planned and will be meticulously executed. Not one shall lack her maid. The animals will not have any lack. For my mouth has commanded it. And then it says here, and it's, and this word here is, um, is its breath. I think, I think it's easier to see this. So we find it this way. Not his spirit. It's, it's wind or it's breath. Now, let me explain this. My mouth, this is masculine. His breath, this is masculine. And so it refers to the same idea, mouth, right? My mouth has commanded it. And then it's breath has gathered them or his wind has gathered them. And so that would be the picture that God has spoken and the breath or the wind that comes out will execute it. So the, the speech of God is utterly powerful in a very imagery sense. God opens his mouth to give his command. And so this is an A. And it's wind or it's breath, which is the mouth, wind or breath that comes out of the mouth, will execute that command. And so God, whatever God says, it will happen because this is the imagery that we are given. Then it says, God has cast lot for them. These are the animals. His hand has divided it among them with a measuring line. Now, this idea of measuring line, it means that it is going to be exact. It is very specific. And so the casting of the lot and the dividing of it gives you a picture of the promised land divided or cast lots to give to the tribes. In the same way, God is doing that for the animals, for the land the Goyim came from, and they shall possess it forever. And this means a long time. And it says, from generation to generation, they will dwell in it also a long time. And this is an A and a B. This is a certainty because God has done the allocation. So when God does the allocation, then they, the animals will inherit the land that the people who attacks Israel were staying. In the great destruction, there will be no rebuilding. 
the animals will be the ones occupying. And God is now instructing Israel. When you read this, you will understand. Look at what God has done. Say in the book of Genesis, where he destroyed the world. He said it and it happened. And so that is what is important for us to understand that the instructions that God comes out from the mouth, where in the book of Genesis, say in, in chapter one, we always read the word, and God said. It is much more than saying something. It is when God opens his mouth and instructs it, and the, the things will happen according to what he has said. So when you look at the book of the Lord, like in Genesis, you can be assured that whatever chapter 34 has so described for the first 14 verses, it will happen soon enough one day. And with this, we come to the end of our session today.